Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind by Gustav Le Bon, 1896. Preface The following work is devoted to an account of the characteristics of crowds, the whole of the common characteristics with which heredity endows the individuals of a race constitute the genius of the race. When, however, a certain number of these individuals are gathered together in a crowd for purposes of action, observation proves that, from the mere fact of their being assembled, there result certain new psychological characteristics which are added to the racial characteristics and differ from them at times to a very considerable degree. Organized crowds have always played an important part in the life of peoples, but this part has never been of such moment as at present. The substitution of the unconscious action of crowds for the conscious activity of individuals is one of the principal characteristics of the present age. I have endeavored to examine the difficult problem presented by crowds in a purely scientific manner, that is, by making an effort to proceed with method and without being influenced by opinions, theories, and doctrines. This, I believe, is the only mode of arriving at the discovery of some few particles of truth, especially when dealing, as is the case here, with a question that is the subject of impassioned controversy. A man of science bent on verifying a phenomenon is not called upon to concern himself with the interest his verifications may hurt. In a recent publication, an eminent thinker M. Goble de Alvela made the remark that, belonging to none of the contemporary schools, I am occasionally found in opposition of sundry of the conclusions of all of them. I hope this new work will merit a similar observation. To belong to a school is necessarily to espouse its prejudices and preconceived opinions. Still, I should explain to the reader why he will find me draw conclusions from my investigations which it might be thought at first sight they do not bear. Why, for instance, after noting the extreme mental inferiority of crowds, picked assemblies included? I yet affirmed it would be dangerous to meddle with their organization, notwithstanding this inferiority. The reason is that the most attentive observation of the facts of history has invariably demonstrated to me that social organisms, being every whit as complicated as those of all beings, it is in no wise in our power to force them to undergo on a sudden far-reaching transformations. Nature has recourse at times to radical measures, but never after our fashion, which explains how it is that nothing is more fatal to a people than the mania for great reforms. However excellent these reforms may appear theoretically, they would only be useful were it possible to change instantaneously the genius of nations. This power, however, is only possessed by time. Men are ruled by ideas, sentiments, and customs matters which are of the essence of ourselves. Institutions and laws are the outward manifestation of our character, the expression of its needs. Being its outcome, institutions and laws cannot change this character. The study of social phenomena cannot be separated from that of the peoples among whom they have come into existence. From the philosophic point of view, these phenomena may have an absolute value. In practice, they have only a relative value. It is necessary, in consequence, when studying a social phenomenon, to consider it successively under two very different aspects. It will then be seen that the teachers of pure reason are very often contrary to those of practical reason. There are scarcely any data even physical, 
to which this distinction is not applicable. From the point of view of absolute truth, a cube or a circle are invariable geometrical figures, rigorously defined by certain formulas. From the point of view of the impression they make on our eye, these geometrical figures may assume very varied shapes. By perspective, the cube may be transformed into a pyramid or a square, the circle into an ellipse or a straight line. Moreover, the consideration of these fictitious shapes is far more important than that of the real shapes, for it is they and they alone that we see and that can be reproduced by photography or in pictures. In certain cases, there is more truth in the unreal than in the real. To present objects with their exact geometrical forms would be to distort nature and render it unrecognizable. If we imagine a world whose inhabitants could only copy or photograph objects but were unable to touch them, it would be very difficult for such persons to attain to an exact idea of their form. Moreover, the knowledge of this form, accessible only to a small number of learned men, would present but a very minor interest. The philosopher who studies social phenomena should bear in mind that side by side with their theoretical value, they possess a practical value, and that this latter, so far as the evolution of civilization is concerned, is alone of importance. The recognition of this fact should render him very circumspect with regard to the conclusions that logic would seem at first to enforce upon him. There are many other motives that dictate to him a like reserve. The complexity of social facts is such that it is impossible to grasp them as a whole and to foresee the effects of their reciprocal influence. It seems too that behind the visible facts are hidden at times thousands of invisible causes. Visible social phenomena appear to be the result of an immense unconscious working that as a rule is beyond the reach of our analysis. Perceptible phenomena may be compared to the waves which are the expression on the surface of the ocean of deep-lying disturbances of which we know nothing. So far as the majority of their acts are concerned, crowds display a singularly inferior mentality. Yet there are other acts in which they appear to be guided by those mysterious forces which the ancients denominated destiny, nature, or providence, which we call the voices of the dead, and whose power it is impossible to overlook, although we ignore their essence. It would seem at times as if there were latent forces in the inner being of nations which serve to guide them. What, for instance, can be more complicated, more logical, more marvelous than a language? Yet whence can this admirably organized production have arisen, except it be the outcome of the unconscious genius of crowds? The most learned academics, the most esteemed grammarians, can do no more than note down the laws that govern languages. They would be utterly incapable of creating them. Even with respect to the ideas of great men, are we certain that they are exclusively the offspring of their brains. No doubt such ideas are always created by solitary minds, but is it not the genius of crowds that has furnished the thousands of grains of dust forming the soil in which they have sprung up? Crowds, doubtless, are always unconscious, but this very unconsciousness is perhaps one of the secrets of their strength. In the natural world, beings exclusively governed by instinct accomplish acts whose marvelous complexity astounds us. Reason 
is an attribute of humanity, of too recent date, and still too imperfect to reveal to us the laws of the unconscious, and still more to take its place. The part played by the unconscious in all our acts is immense, and that played by reason very small. The unconscious acts like a force still unknown. If we wish, then, to remain within the narrow but safe limits within which science can attain to knowledge, and not to wander in the domain of vague conjecture and vain hypothesis, all we must do is simply to take note of such phenomena as are accessible to us and confine ourselves to their consideration. Every conclusion drawn from our observation is, as a rule, premature, for behind the phenomena which we see clearly are other phenomena that we see indistinctly, and perhaps behind these latter, yet others which we do not see at all. Introduction The Error of Crowds The great upheavals which precede changes of civilizations, such as the fall of the Roman Empire and the foundation of the Arabian Empire, seem at first sight determined more especially by political transformations, foreign invasion, or the overthrow of dynasties. But a more attentive study of these events shows that behind their apparent causes, the real cause is generally seen to be a profound modification in the ideas of the peoples. The true historical upheavals are not those which astonish us by their grandeur and violence. The only important changes whence the renewal of civilizations results affect ideas, conceptions, and beliefs. The memorable events of history are the visible effects of the invisible changes of human thoughts. The reason these great events are so rare is that there is nothing so stable in a race as the inherited groundwork of its thoughts. The present epoch is one of these critical moments in which the thought of mankind is undergoing a process of transformation. Two fundamental factors are at the base of this transformation. The first is the destruction of those religious, political, and social beliefs in which all the elements of our civilization are rooted. The second is the creation of entirely new conditions of existence and thought as the result of modern scientific and industrial discoveries. The ideas of the past, although half destroyed, being still very powerful, and the ideas which are to replace them being still in process of formation. The modern age represents a period of transition and anarchy. It is not easy to say as yet what will one day be evolved from this necessarily somewhat chaotic period. What will be the fundamental ideas on which the societies that are to succeed our own will be built up? We do not at present know. Still, it is already clear that on whatever lines the societies of the future are organized, they will have to count with a new power, with the last surviving sovereign force of modern times, the power of crowds. On the ruins of so many ideas formerly considered beyond discussion, and today decayed or decaying, of so many sources of authority, that successive revolutions have destroyed this power, which alone has arisen in their steed, seems soon destined to absorb the others. While all our ancient beliefs are tottering and disappearing, while the old pillars of society are giving way one by one, the power of the crowd is the only force that nothing menaces and of which the prestige is continually on the increase. The age we are about to enter will in truth be the era of crowds. <laughs>
Scarcely a century ago, the traditional policy of European states and the rivalries of sovereigns were the principal factors that shaped events. The opinion of the masses scarcely counted, and most frequently indeed did not count at all. Today, it is the traditions which used to obtain in politics and the individual tendencies and rivalries of rulers which do not count, while on the contrary, the voice of the masses has become preponderant. It is this voice that dictates their conduct to kings, whose endeavor is to take note of its utterances. The destinies of nations are elaborated at present in the heart of the masses and no longer in the councils of princes. The entry of the popular classes into political life, that is to say, in reality, their progressive transformation into governing classes, is one of the most striking characteristics of our epoch of transition. The introduction of universal suffrage, which exercised for a long time but little influence, is not, as might be thought, the distinguishing feature of this transference of political power. The progressive growth of the power of the masses took place at first by the propagation of certain ideas, which have slowly implanted themselves in men's minds, and afterwards by the gradual association of individuals bent on bringing about the realization of theoretical conceptions. It is by association that crowds have come to procure ideas with respect to their interest which are very clearly defined if not particularly just, and have arrived at a consciousness of their strength. The masses are founding syndicates before which the authorities capitulate one after the other. They are also founding labor unions, which in spite of all economic laws tend to regulate the conditions of labor and wages. They return to assemblies in which the government is vested representatives utterly lacking initiative and independence and reduced most often to nothing else than the spokesmen of the committees that have chosen them. Today the claims of the masses are becoming more and more sharply defined and amount to nothing less than a determination to utterly destroy society as it now exists with a view to making it hark back to that primitive communism which was the normal condition of all human groups before the dawn of civilization. Limitations of the hours of labor, the nationalization of mines, railways, factories, and the soil, the equal distribution of all products, the elimination of all the upper classes for the benefit of the popular classes, etc. Such are these claims. Little adapted to reasoning, crowds on the contrary are quick to act. As the result of their present organization, their strength has become immense. The dogmas whose birth we are witnessing will soon have the force of the old dogmas, that is to say, the tyrannical and sovereign force of being above discussion. The divine right of the masses is about to replace the divine right of kings. The writers who enjoy the favor of our middle classes, those who best represent their rather narrow ideas, their somewhat prescribed views, their rather superficial skepticism, and their at times somewhat excessive egoism, display profound alarm at this new power which they see growing. And to combat the disorder in men's minds, they are addressing despairing appeals to those moral forces of the church for which they formerly professed so much disdain. They talk to us of the bankruptcy of science. Go back in penitence to Rome and remind us of the teachings of revealed truth. These new converts forget that it is too late. Had they been really touched by grace, a like operation could not have the same influence on minds less concerned with the preoccupations 
which beset these recent adherents to religion. The masses repudiate today the gods which their admonishers repudiated yesterday and helped to destroy. There is no power, divine or human, that can oblige a stream to flow back to its source. There has been no bankruptcy of science, and science has had no share in the present intellectual anarchy, nor in the making of the new power which is springing up in the mindset of this anarchy. Science promised us truth, or at least a knowledge of such relations as our intelligence can seize. It never promised us peace or happiness. Sovereignly indifferent to our feelings, it is deaf to our lamentations. It is for us to endeavor to live with science, since nothing can bring back the illusions it has destroyed. Universal symptoms, visible in all nations, show us the rapid growth of the power of crowds. And do not admit of our supposing that it is destined to cease growing at an early date. Whatever fate it may reserve for us, we shall have to submit to it. All reasoning against it is a mere vain war of words. Certainly it is possible that the advent to power of the masses marks one of the last stages of Western civilization. A complete return to those periods of confused anarchy which seemed always destined to precede the birth of every new society. But may this result be prevented? Up to now these thoroughgoing destructions of a worn-out civilization have constituted the most obvious task of the masses. It is not indeed today merely that this can be traced. History tells us that from the moment when the moral forces on which a civilization rested have lost their strength, its final dissolution is brought about by those unconscious and brutal crowds known justifiably enough as barbarians. Civilizations as yet have only been created and directed by a small intellectual aristocracy, never by crowds. Crowds are only powerful for destruction. Their rule is always tantamount to a barbarian phase. A civilization involves fixed rules, discipline, a passing from the instinctive to the rational state, forethought for the future, an elevated degree of culture, all of them conditions that crowds left to themselves have invariably shown themselves incapable of realizing. In consequence of the purely destructive nature of their power, crowds act like those microbes which hasten the dissolution of enfeebled or dead bodies. When the structure of a civilization is rotten, it is always the masses that bring about its downfall. It is at such a juncture that their chief mission is plainly visible, and that for a while the philosophy of number seems the only philosophy of history. Is the same fate in store for our civilization? There is ground to fear that this is the case, but we are not as yet in a position to be certain of it. However this may be, we are bound to resign ourselves to the reign of the masses, since want of foresight has in succession overthrown all the barriers that might have kept the crowd in check. We have a very slight knowledge of these crowds which are beginning to be the object of so much discussion. Professional students of psychology, having lived far from them, have always ignored them, and when, as of late, they have turned their attention in this direction, it has only been to consider the crimes crowds are capable of committing. Without a doubt, criminal crowds exist, but virtuous and heroic crowds, and crowds of many other kinds, are also to be met with. The crimes of crowds only constitute a particular phase of their psychology. The mental constitution of crowds is not to be learnt merely by a study of their crimes, and more than that of an individual 
by a mere description of his vices. However, in point of fact, all the world's masters, all the founders of religions or empires, the apostles of all beliefs, eminent statesmen, and, in a more modest sphere, the mere chiefs of small groups of men have always been unconscious psychologists, possessed of an instinctive and often very sure knowledge of the character of crowds. And it is their accurate knowledge of this character that has enabled them to so easily establish their mastery. Napoleon had a marvelous insight into the psychology of the masses of the country over which he reigned, but he at times completely misunderstood the psychology of crowds belonging to other races. And it is because he thus misunderstood it that he engaged in Spain, and notably in Russia, in conflicts in which his power received blows which were destined within a brief space of time to ruin it. A knowledge of the psychology of crowds is today the last resource of the statesman who wishes not to govern them. That is becoming a very difficult matter, but at any rate, not to be too much governed by them. It is only by obtaining some sort of insight into the psychology of crowds that it can be understood how slight is the action upon them of laws and institutions how powerless they are to hold any opinions other than those which are imposed upon them, and that it is not with rules based on theories of pure equity that they are to be led, but by seeking what produces an impression on them and what seduces them. For instance, should a legislator wishing to impose a new tax choose that which would be theoretically the most just? By no means. In practice, the most unjust may be the best for the masses. Should it at the same time be the least obvious and apparently the least burdensome, it will be the most easily tolerated. It is for this reason that an indirect tax, however exorbitant it may be, will always be accepted by the crowd, because being paid daily in fractions of a farthing on objects of consumption, it will not interfere with the habits of the crowd and will pass unperceived. Replace it by a proportional tax on wages or income of any kind to be paid in a lump sum and were this new imposition theoretically ten times less burdensome than the other, it would give rise to unanimous protests. This arises from the fact that a sum relatively high, which will appear immense and will in consequence strike the imagination, has been substituted for the unperceived fractions of a farthing. The new tax would only appear light had it been saved farthing by farthing, but this economic proceeding involves an amount of foresight of which the masses are incapable. The example which proceeds is of the simplest its appositeness will be easily perceived. It did not escape the attention of such a psychologist as Napoleon, but our modern legislators, ignorant as they are of the characteristics of a crowd, are unable to appreciate it. Experience has not taught them as yet to a sufficient degree that men never shape their conduct upon the teaching of pure reason. Many other practical applications might be made of the psychology of crowds. A knowledge of this science throws the most vivid light on a great number of historical and economic phenomena totally incomprehensible without it. I shall have occasion to show that the reason why the most remarkable of modern historians, Taine, has at times so imperfectly understood the events of the great French Revolution is that it never occurred to him to study the genius of crowds. He took as his guide in the study of this complicated period the descriptive method resorted to by naturalists. But the moral forces are almost absent in the case of the phenomena which naturalists have to study. <laughs> 
Yet, it is precisely these forces that constitute the true mainsprings of history. In consequence, merely looked at from its practical side, the study of the psychology of crowds deserved to be attempted. Were its interest that resulting from pure curiosity only, it would still merit attention. It is as interesting to decipher the motives of the actions of men as to determine the characteristics of a mineral or a plant. Our study of the genius of crowds can merely be a brief synthesis, a simple summary of our investigations. Nothing more must be demanded of it than a few suggestive views. Others will work the ground more thoroughly. Today we only touch the surface of a still almost virgin soil. Book 1 The Mind of Crowds Chapter 1 General Characteristics of Crowds Psychological Law of Their Mental Unity in its ordinary sense, the word crowd means a gathering of individuals of whatever nationality, profession, or sex, and whatever be the chances that have brought them together. From the psychological point of view, the expression crowd assumes quite a different signification. Under certain given circumstances, and only under those circumstances, an agglomeration of men presents new characteristics very different from those of the individuals composing it. The sentiments and ideas of all the persons in the gathering take one and the same direction, and their conscious personality vanishes. A collective mind is formed, doubtless transitory, but presenting very clearly defined characteristics. The gathering has thus become what, in the absence of a better expression, I will call an organized crowd, or, if the term is considered preferable, a psychological crowd. It forms a single being and is subjected to the law of the mental unity of crowds. It is evident that it is not by the mere fact of a number of individuals finding themselves accidentally side by side that they acquire the character of an organized crowd. A thousand individuals accidentally gathered in a public place without any determined object in no way constitute a crowd from the psychological point of view. To acquire the special characteristics of such a crowd the influence is necessary of certain predisposing causes of which we shall have to determine the nature. The disappearance of conscious personality and the turning of feelings and thoughts in a definite direction, which are the primary characteristics of a crowd about to become organized, do not always involve the simultaneous presence of a number of individuals on one spot. Thousands of isolated individuals may acquire at certain moments, and under the influence of certain violent emotions, such for example as a great national event, the characteristics of a psychological crowd. It will be sufficient in that case that a mere chance should bring them together for their acts to at once assume the characteristics peculiar to the acts of a crowd. At certain moments half a dozen men might constitute a psychological crowd, which may not happen in the case of hundreds of men gathered together by accident. On the other hand, an entire nation, though there may be no visible agglomeration, may become a crowd under the action of certain influences. A psychological crowd, once constituted, it acquires certain provisional but determinable general characteristics. To these general characteristics, there are adjoined particular characteristics which vary according to the elements of which the crowd is composed, and may modify its mental constitution. Psychological crowds 
then are susceptible of classification, and when we come to occupy ourselves with this matter, we shall see that a heterogeneous crowd, that is, a crowd composed of dissimilar elements, presents certain characteristics in common with homogeneous crowds, that is, with crowds composed of elements more or less akin, sex, caste, and classes. And side by side with these common characteristics, particularities which permit of the two kinds of crowds being differentiated. But before occupying ourselves with the different categories of crowds, we must first of all examine the characteristics common to them all. We shall set to work like the naturalist, who begins by describing the general characteristic common to all the members of a family before concerning himself with the particular characteristics which allow the differentiation of the genera and species that the family includes. It is not easy to describe the mind of crowds with exactness because its organization varies not only according to race and composition but also according to the nature and intensity of the exciting causes to which crowds are subjected. The same difficulty, however, presents itself in the psychological study of an individual. It is only in novels that individuals are found to transverse their whole life with an unvarying character. It is only the uniformity of the environment that creates the apparent uniformity of characters. I have shown elsewhere that all mental constitutions contain possibilities of character which may be manifested in consequence of a sudden change of environment. Dix explains how it was that among the most savage members of the French Convention were to be found inoffensive citizens who, under ordinary circumstances, would have been peaceable notaries or virtuous magistrates. The storm passed, they resumed their normal character of quiet, law-abiding citizens. Napoleon found amongst them his most docile servants. It being impossible to study here all the successive degrees of organization of crowds, we shall concern ourselves more especially with such crowds as have attained to the phase of complete organization. In this way, we shall see what crowds may become, but not what they invariably are. It is only in this advanced phase of organization that certain new and special characteristics are supposed on the unvarying and dominant character of the race. Then takes place that turning already alluded to of all the feelings and thoughts of the collectivity in an identical direction. It is only under such circumstances, too, that what I have called above the psychological law of the mental unity of crowds comes into play. Among the psychological characteristics of crowds, there are some that they may present in common with isolated individuals, and others, on the contrary, which are absolutely peculiar to them and are only to be met with in collectivities. It is these special characteristics that we shall first study in order to show their importance. The most striking peculiarity presented by a psychological crowd is the following. Whoever be the individuals that compose it, however like or unlike be their mode of life, their occupations, their character, or their intelligence, the fact that they have been transformed into a crowd puts them in possession of a sort of collective mind which makes them feel, think, and act in a manner quite different from that in which each individual of them would feel, think, and act were he in a state of isolation. There are certain ideas and feelings which do not come into being or do not transform themselves into acts except in the case of individuals forming a crowd. The psychological crowd is a provisional being formed of heterogeneous elements 
which for a moment are combined, exactly as the cells which constitute a living body form by their reunion, a new being which displays characteristics very different from those possessed by each of the cells singly. Contrary to an opinion which one is astonished to find coming from the pen of so acute a philosopher as Herbert Spencer, in the aggregate which constitutes a crowd, there is in no sort of a summing up of or an average struck between its elements. What really takes place is a combination followed by the creation of new characteristics. Just as in chemistry, certain elements, when brought into contact, bases and acids, for example, combine to form a new body possessing properties quite different from those of the bodies that have served to form it. It is easy to prove how much the individual forming part of a crowd differs from the isolated individual, but it is less easy to discover the causes of this difference. To obtain, at any rate, a glimpse of them, it is necessary in the first place to call to mind the truth established by modern psychology that unconscious phenomena play an altogether preponderating part not only in organic life but also in the operations of the intelligence. The conscious life of the mind is of small importance in comparison with its unconscious life. The most subtle analyst, the most acute observer, is scarcely successful in discovering more than a very small number of the unconscious motives that determine his conduct. Our conscious acts are the outcome of an unconscious substratum created in the mind in the main by hereditary influences. This substratum consists of the innumerable common characteristics handed down from generation to generation, which constitute the genius of a race. Behind the avowed causes of our acts, there undoubtedly lie secret causes that we do not avow. But behind these secret causes, there are many others, more secret still, which we ourselves ignore. The greater part of our daily actions are the result of hidden motives which escape our observation. It is more especially with respect to those unconscious elements which constitute the genius of a race that all the individuals belonging to it resemble each other. While it is principally in respect to the conscious elements of their character, the fruit of education, and yet more of exceptional hereditary conditions, that they differ from each other. Men, the most unlike in the matter of their intelligence, possess instincts, passions, and feelings that are very similar. In the case of everything that belongs to the realm of sentiment, religion, politics, morality, the affections, and so on, the most eminent men seldom surpass the standard of the most ordinary individuals. From the intellectual point of view, an abyss may exist between a great mathematician and his bootmaker. But from the point of view of character, the difference is most often slight or non-existent. It is precisely these general qualities of character, governed by forces of which we are unconscious and possessed by the majority of the normal individuals of a race in much the same degree. It is precisely these qualities, I say, that in crowds become common property. In the collective mind, the intellectual aptitudes of the individuals and in the consequence, their individuality are weakened. The heterogeneous is swamped by the homogeneous and the unconscious qualities obtain the upper hand. This fact that crowds possess in common ordinary qualities explain why they can never accomplish acts demanding a high degree of intelligence. 
the decisions affecting matters of general interest come to by an assembly of men of distinction. But specialists in different walks of life are not sensibly superior to the decisions that would be adopted by a gathering of imbeciles. The truth is, they can only bring to bear in common on the work in hand those mediocre qualities which are the birthright of every average individual. In crowds, it is stupidity and not mother wit that is accumulated. It is not all the world, as is so often repeated, that has more wit than Voltaire. But assuredly, Voltaire that has more wit than all the world, if by all the world crowds are to be understood. If the individuals of a crowd confine themselves to putting in common the ordinary qualities of which each of them has his share, there would merely result the striking of an average, and not, as we have said, is actuality the case, the creation of new characteristics. How is it that these new characteristics are created? This is what we are now to investigate. Different causes determine the appearance of these characteristics peculiar to crowds and not possessed by isolated individuals. The first is that the individual forming part of a crowd acquires solely from numerical considerations a sentiment of invincible power which allows him to yield to instincts which, had he been alone, he would perforce have kept under restraint. He will be the less disposed to check himself from the consideration that a crowd being anonymous and in consequence irresponsible, the sentiment of responsibility which always controls individuals disappears entirely. The second cause, which is contagion, also intervenes to determine the manifestation in crowds of their special characteristics and at the same time the trend they are to take. Contagion is a phenomenon of which it is easy to establish the presence, but that it is not easy to explain. It must be classed among those phenomena of a hypnotic order, which we shall study shortly. In a crowd, every sentiment and act is contagious, and contagious to such a degree that an individual readily sacrifices his personal interest to the collective interest. This is an aptitude very contrary to his nature, and of which a man is scarcely capable except when he makes part of a crowd. A third cause, and by far the most important, determines in the individuals of a crowd special characteristics which are quite contrary at times to those presented by the isolated individual. I allude to that suggestibility of which, moreover, the contagion mentioned above is neither more nor less than an effect. To understand this phenomenon, it is necessary to bear in mind certain recent physiological discoveries. We know today that by various processes an individual may be brought into such a condition that Having entirely lost his conscious personality, he obeys all the suggestions of the operator who has deprived him of it, and commits acts in utter contradiction with his character and habits. The most careful observations seem to prove that an individual emerged for some length of time in a crowd in action soon finds himself, either in consequence of the magnetic influence given out by the crowd, or from some other cause of which we are ignorant, in a special state, which much resembles the state of fascination in which the hypnotized individual finds himself in the hands of the hypnotizer. The activity of the brain being paralyzed in the case of the hypnotized subject, 
the latter becomes the slave of all the unconscious activities of his spinal cord, which the hypnotizer directs at will. The conscious personality has entirely vanished. Will and discernment are lost. All feelings and thoughts are bent in the direction determined by the hypnotizer. Such also is approximately the state of the individual forming part of a psychological crowd. He is no longer conscious of his acts. In his case, as in the case of the hypnotized subject, at the same time that certain faculties are destroyed. Others may be brought to a high degree of exaltation. Under the influence of suggestion, he will undertake the accomplishment of certain acts with irresistible impetuosity. This impetuosity is the more irresistible in the case of crowds than in that of the hypnotized subject, from the fact that the suggestion being the same for all the individuals of the crowd, it gains in strength by reciprocity. The individualities in the crowd who might possess a personality sufficiently strong to resist the suggestion are too few in number to struggle against the current. At the utmost, they may be able to attempt a diversion by means of different suggestions. It is in this way, for instance, that a happy expression, an image opportunely evoked, have occasionally deterred crowds from the most bloodthirsty acts. We see then that the disappearance of the conscious personality, the predominance of the unconscious personality, the turning by means of suggestion and contagion of feelings and ideas in an identical direction, the tendency to immediately transform the suggested ideas into acts, these we see are the principal characteristics of the individual forming part of a crowd. He is no longer himself, but has become an automaton who has ceased to be guided by his will. Moreover, by the mere fact that he forms part of an organized crowd, a man descends several rungs in the ladder of civilization. Isolated, he may be a cultivated individual. In a crowd, he is a barbarian, that is, a creature acting by instinct. He possesses the spontaneity, the violence, the ferocity, and also the enthusiasm and heroism of primitive beings, whom he further tends to resemble by the facility with which he allows himself to be impressed by words and images, which would be entirely without action on each of the isolated individuals composing the crowd and to be induced to commit acts contrary to his most obvious interest and his best known habits. An individual in a crowd is a grain of sand amid other grains of sand, which the wind stirs up at will. It is for these reasons that juries are seen to deliver verdicts of which each individual juror would disapprove that parliamentary assemblies adopt laws and measures of which each of their members would disapprove in his own person. Taken separately, the men of the convention were enlightened citizens of peaceful habits. United in a crowd, they did not hesitate to give their adhesion to the most savage proposals, to guillotine individuals most clearly innocent, and contrary to their interests, to renounce their inviolability and to decimate themselves. It is not only by his acts that the individual in a crowd differs essentially from himself. Even before he has entirely lost his independence, his ideas and feelings have undergone a transformation, and the transformation is so profound as to change the miser into a spendthrift the skeptic into a believer, the honest man into a criminal, and the coward into a hero.
the renunciation of all its privileges with the nobility voted in a moment of enthusiasm during the celebrated night of August 4th 1789 would certainly never have been consented to by any of its members taken singly the conclusion to be drawn from what proceeds is that the crowd is always intellectually inferior to the isolated individual but that from the point of view of feelings and of the acts these feelings provoke the crowd may according to circumstances be better or worse than the individual all depends on the nature of the suggestion to which the crowd is exposed that is the point that has been completely misunderstood by writers who have only studied crowds from the criminal point of view doubtless a crowd is often criminal but also it is often heroic it is crowds rather than isolated individuals that may be induced to run the risk of death to secure the triumph of a creed or an idea that may be fired with enthusiasm for glory and honor that are led on almost without bread and without arms as in the age of the crusades to deliver the tomb of Christ from the infidel or as in 93 to defend the fatherland such heroism is without doubt somewhat unconscious but it is of such heroism that history is made were peoples only to be credited with the great actions performed in cold blood the annals of the world would register but few of them chapter 2 the sentiments and morality of crowds having indicated in a general way the principles characteristics of crowds it remains to study these characteristics in detail it will be remarked that among the special characteristics of crowds there are several such as impulsiveness irritability incapacity to reason the absence of judgment and of the critical spirit the exaggeration of the sentiments and others besides which are almost always observed in beings belonging to inferior forms of evolution in women savages and children for instance however I merely indicate this analogy in passing its demonstration is outside the scope of this work it would moreover be useless for persons acquainted with the psychology of primitive beings and would scarcely carry conviction to those in ignorance of this matter I now proceed to the successive consideration of the different characteristics that may be observed in the majority of crowds 1 impulsiveness mobility and irritability of crowds when studying the fundamental characteristics of a crowd we stated that it is guided almost exclusively by unconscious motives its acts are far more under the influence of the spinal cord than of the brain in this respect a crowd is closely akin to quite primitive beings the acts performed may be perfect so far as their execution is concerned but as they are not directed by the brain the individual conducts himself according as the exciting causes to which he is submitted may happen to decide a crowd is at the mercy of all external exciting causes and reflects their incessant variations it is the slave of the impulses which it receives the isolated individual may be submitted to the same exciting causes as the man in a crowd but as his brain shows him the inadvisability of yielding to them he refrains from yielding this truth may be physiologically expressed by saying that the isolated individual possesses the capacity of dominating his reflex actions while a crowd is devoid of this capacity the varying impulses to which crowds obey may be according to their exciting causes 
general or cruel, heroic or cowardly, but they will always be so imperious that the interest of the individual, even the interest of self-preservation, will not dominate them. The exciting causes that may act on crowds being so varied and crowds always obeying them, crowds are in consequence extremely mobile. This explains how it is that we see them pass in a moment from the most bloodthirsty ferocity to the most extreme generosity and heroism. A crowd may easily enact the part of an executioner, but not less easily that of a martyr. It is crowds that have furnished the torrents of blood requisite for the triumph of every belief. It is not necessary to go back to the heroic ages to see what crowds are capable of in this latter direction. They are never sparing of their life in an insurrection, and not long since a general, becoming suddenly popular, might easily have found a hundred thousand men ready to sacrifice their lives for his cause had he demanded it. Any display of premeditation by crowds is in consequence out of the question. They may be animated in succession by the most contrary sentiments, but they will always be under the influence of the exciting causes of the moment. They are like the leaves which a tempest whirls up and scatters in every direction and then allows to fall. When studying later on certain revolutionary crowds, we shall give some examples of the variability of their sentiments. This mobility of crowds renders them very difficult to govern, especially when a measure of public authority has fallen into their hands. Did not the necessities of everyday life constitute a sort of invisible regulator of existence? It would scarcely be possible for democracies to last. Still, though the wishes of crowds are frenzied, they are not durable. Crowds are as incapable of willing as of thinking for any length of time. A crowd is not merely impulsive and mobile. Like a savage, it is not prepared to admit that anything can come between its desire and the realization of its desire. It is the less capable of understanding such an intervention in consequence of the feeling of irresistible power given it by its numerical strength. The notion of impossibility disappears for the individual in a crowd. An isolated individual knows well enough that alone he cannot set fire to a palace or loot a shop, and should he be tempted to do so, he will easily resist the temptation. Making part of a crowd, he is conscious of the power given him by number, and it is sufficient to suggest to him ideas of murder or pillage for him to yield immediately to temptation. An unexpected obstacle will be destroyed with frenzied rage. Did the human organism allow of the perpetuity of furious passion? It might be said that the normal condition of a crowd, balked in its wishes, is just such a state of furious passion. The fundamental characteristics of the race, which constitute the unvarying source, from which all our sentiments spring, always exert an influence on the irritability of crowds, their impulsiveness, and their mobility, as on all the popular sentiments we shall have to study. All crowds are doubtless always irritable and impulsive, but with great variations of degree. For instance, the difference between a Latin and an Anglo-Saxon crowd is striking. The most recent facts in French history throw a vivid light on this point. The mere publication, 25 years ago, of a telegram relating an insult supposed to have been offered an ambassador was sufficient to determine an explosion of fury, whence followed immediately a terrible war. Some years later, the telegraphic announcement of an insignificant reverse 
at Langson proved a fresh explosion, which brought about the instantaneous overthrow of the government. At the same moment, a much more serious reverse undergone by the English expedition to Khartoum produced only a slight emotion in England, and no ministry was overturned. Crowds are everywhere distinguished by feminine characteristics. But Latin crowds are the most feminine of all. Whoever trusts in them may rapidly attain a lofty destiny, but to do so is to be perpetually skirting the brink of a tarpeian rock with the certainty of one day being precipitated from it. 2. The Suggestibility and Credulity of Crowds when defining crowds, we said that one of their general characteristics was an excessive suggestibility, and we have shown to what an extent suggestions are contagious in every human agglomeration, a fact which explains the rapid turning of the sentiments of a crowd in a definite direction. However indifferent it may be supposed, a crowd, as a rule, is in a state of expectant attention which renders suggestion easy. The first suggestion formulated, which arises, implants itself immediately by a process of contagion in the brains of all assembled, and the identical bent of the sentiments of the crowd is immediately an accomplished fact. As is the case with all persons under the influence of suggestion, the idea which has entered the brain tends to transform itself into an act. Whether the act is that of setting fire to a palace or involves self-sacrifice, a crowd lends itself to it with equal facility. All will depend on the nature of the exciting cause, and no longer, as in the case of the isolated individual, on the relations existing between the act suggested and the sum total of the reasons which may be urged against its realization. In consequence, a crowd perpetually hovering on the borderland of unconsciousness, readily yielding to all suggestions, having all the violence of feeling peculiar to beings who cannot appeal to the influence of reason, deprived of all critical faculty, cannot be otherwise than excessively credulous. The improbable does not exist for a crowd, and it is necessary to bear this circumstance well in mind to understand the facility with which are created and propagated the most improbable legends and stories. The creation of the legends which so easily obtain circulation in crowds is not solely the consequence of their extreme credulity. It is also the result of the prodigious perversions that events undergo in the imagination of a throng. The simplest event that comes under the observation of a crowd is soon totally transformed. A crowd thinks in images, and the image itself immediately calls up a series of other images, having no logical connection with the first. We can easily conceive this state by thinking of the fantastic succession of ideas to which we are sometimes led by calling up in our minds any fact. Our reason shows us the incoherence there is in these images, but a crowd is almost blind to this truth, and confuses with the real event what the deforming action of its imagination has superimposed thereon. A crowd scarcely distinguishes between the subjective and the objective. It accepts as real the images evoked in its mind, though they most often have only a very distant relation with the observed fact. The ways in which a crowd perverts any event of which it is a witness ought, it would seem, to be innumerable and unlike each other, since the individuals composing the gathering are of very different temperaments, but this is not the case. As the result of contagion, the perversions are of the same kind, and take the same shape in the case of all the assembled individuals. 
The first perversion of the truth affected by one of the individuals of the gathering is the starting point of the contagious suggestion. Before St. George appeared on the walls of Jerusalem to all the crusaders, he was certainly perceived in the first instant by one of those present. By dint of suggestion and contagion, the miracle signalized by a single person was immediately accepted by all. Such is always the mechanism of the collective hallucinations so frequent in history. Hallucinations which seem to have all the recognized characteristics of authenticity, since they are phenomena observed by thousands of persons. To combat what precedes, the mental quality of the individuals composing a crowd must not be brought into consideration. This quality is without importance. From the moment that they form part of a crowd, the learned man and the ignoramus are equally incapable of observation. This thesis may seem paradoxical. To demonstrate it beyond doubt, it would be necessary to investigate a great number of historical facts, and several volumes would be insufficient for the purpose. Still, as I do not wish to leave the reader under the impression of unproved assertions, I shall give him some examples taken at hazard from the immense number of those that might be quoted. The following fact is one of the most typical, because chosen from among collective hallucinations of which a crowd is the victim, and which are to be found individuals of every kind, from the most ignorant to the most highly educated. It is related incidentally by Julian Felix, a naval lieutenant, in his book on sea currents, and has been previously cited by the review Scientique. The frigate, the Bell Pool, was cruising in the open sea for the purpose of finding the cruiser Le Berceau, from which she had been separated by a violent storm. It was broad daylight and in full sunshine. Suddenly the watch signaled a disabled vessel. The crew looked in the direction signaled and everyone, officers and sailors, clearly perceived a raft covered with men towed by boats which were displaying signals of distress. Yet this was nothing more than a collective hallucination. Admiral de Fosses lowered a boat to go to the rescue of the wrecked sailors. On nearing the object sighted, the sailors and officers on the boat saw masses of men in motion stretching out their hands and heard the dull and confused noise of a great number of voices. When the object was reached, those in the boat found themselves simply and solely in the presence of a few branches of trees covered with leaves that had been swept out from the neighboring coast. Before evidence so palpable, the hallucination vanished. The mechanism of a collective hallucination of the kind we have explained is clearly seen at work in this example. On the one hand, we have a crowd in a state of expectant attention. On the other, a suggestion made by the watch signaling a disabled vessel at sea, a suggestion which, by a process of contagion, was accepted by all those present, both officers and sailors. It is not necessary that a crowd should be numerous for the faculty of seeing what is taking place before its eyes to be destroyed, and for the real facts to be replaced by hallucinations unrelated to them. As soon as a few individuals are gathered together, they constitute a crowd, and, though they should be distinguished men of learning, they assume all the characteristics of crowds with regard to matters outside their specialty. The faculty of observation and the critical spirit possessed by each of them individually at once disappears. An ingenious psychologist, Mr. Davy, supplies us with a very curious example in point, recently cited in the Annals des Sciences Physiques and deserving of relation here.
Mr. Davy, having convoked a gathering of distinguished observers, among them one of the most prominent of English scientific men, Mr. Wallace, executed in their presence, and after having allowed them to examine the objects and to place seals where they wished, all the regulation spiritualistic phenomena, the materialization of spirits, writing on slates, etc., having subsequently obtained from these distinguished observers written reports admitting that the phenomena observed could only have been obtained by supernatural means, he revealed to them that they were the result of very simple tricks. The most astonishing feature of Monsieur Davy's investigation, writes the author of this account, is not the marvelousness of the tricks themselves, but the extreme weakness of the reports made with respect to them by the non-initiated witnesses. It is clear then, he says, that witnesses even in number may give circumstantial relations which are completely erroneous, but whose result is that if their descriptions are accepted as exact, the phenomena they describe are inexplicable by trickery. The methods invented by Mr. Davy were so simple that one is astonished that he should have had the boldness to employ them. But he had such a power over the mind of the crowd that he could persuade it that it saw what it did not see. Here, as always, we have the power of the hypnotizer over the hypnotized. Moreover, when this power is seen in action on minds of a superior order and previously invited to be suspicious, it is understandable how easy it is to deceive ordinary crowds. Analogous examples are innumerable. As I write these lines, the papers are full of the story of two little girls found drowned in the Seine. These children, to begin with, were recognized in the most unmistakable manner by half a dozen witnesses. All the affirmations were in such entire concordance that no doubt remained in the mind of the Jug de Instruction. He had the certificate of death drawn up, but just as the burial of the children was to have been proceeded with, a mere chance brought about the discovery that the supposed victims were alive, and had, moreover, but a remote resemblance to the drowned girls. As in several of the examples previously cited, the affirmation of the first witness, himself a victim of illusion, had sufficed to influence the other witnesses. In parallel cases, the starting point of the suggestion always the illusion produced in an individual by more or less vague reminiscences. Contagion following as the result of the affirmation of this initial illusion. If the first observer be very impressionable, it will often be sufficient that the corpse he believes he recognizes should present, apart from all real resemblance, some peculiarity, a scar, or some detail which may evoke the idea of another person. The idea evoked may then become the nucleus of a sort of crystallization which invades the understanding and paralyzes all critical faculty. What the observer then sees is no longer the object itself, but the image evoked in his mind. In this way are to be explained erroneous recognitions of the dead bodies of children by their own mother, as occurred in the following case, already old, but which has been recently recalled by the newspapers. In it are to be traced precisely the two kinds of suggestion of which I have just pointed out the mechanism. The child was recognized by another child, who was mistaken. The series of unwarranted recognitions then began. An extraordinary thing occurred. The day after a schoolboy had recognized the corpse, a woman exclaimed, Good heavens, it is my child! She was taken up to the corpse. She examined the clothing. 
and noted a scar on the forehead. It is certainly, she said, my son who disappeared last July. He has been stolen from me and murdered. The woman was concierge in the Rue du Four. Her name was Chavendre. Her brother-in-law was summoned, and when questioned, he said, That is the little Philibert. Several persons living in the street recognized the child found at La Villette as Philibert Chavendret, among them being the boy's schoolmaster, who based his opinion on a medal worn by the lad. Nevertheless, the neighbors, the brother-in-law, the schoolmaster, and the mother were mistaken. Six weeks later, the identity of the child was established. The boy, belonging to Bordeaux, had been murdered there and brought by a carrying company to Paris. It will be remarked that these recognitions are most often made by women and children. That is to say, by precisely the most impressionable persons. They show us, at the same time, what is the worth in law courts of such witnesses. As far as children, more especially, are concerned, their statements ought never to be invoked. Magistrates are in the habit of repeating that children do not lie. Did they possess a psychological culture a little less rudimentary than is the case, they would know that, on the contrary, children invariably lie. The lie is doubtless innocent, but it is nonetheless a lie. It would be better to decide the fate of an accused person by the toss of a coin than as has been so often done by the evidence of a child. To return to the faculty of observation possessed by crowds, our conclusion is that their collective observations are as erroneous as possible, and that most often they merely represent the illusion of an individual who, by a process of contagion, has suggested his fellows. Facts proving that the most utter mistrust of the evidence of crowds is advisable might be multiplied to any extent. Thousands of men were present 25 years ago at the celebrated Calvary charge during the Battle of Sedan, and yet it is impossible in the face of the most contradictory ocular testimony to decide by whom it was commanded. The English general, Lord Wolseley, has proved in a recent book that up to now the gravest errors of fact have been committed with regard to the most important incidents of the Battle of Waterloo. Facts that hundreds of witnesses had nevertheless attested. Such facts show us what is the value of the testimony of crowds. Treatises on logic include the unanimity of numerous witnesses in the category of the strongest proofs that can be invoked in support of the exactness of a fact. Yet what we know of the psychology of crowds shows that treatises on logic need on this point to be rewritten. The events with regard to which there exists the most doubt are certainly those which have been observed by the greatest number of persons. To say that a fact has been simultaneously verified by thousands of witnesses is to say, as a rule, that the fact is very different from the accepted account of it. It clearly results from what precedes that works of history must be considered as works of pure imagination. They are fanciful accounts of ill-observed facts, accompanied by explanations, the result of reflection. To write such books is the most absolute waste of time. Had not the past left us its literary, artistic, and monumental works, we should know absolutely nothing in reality with regard to bygone times. Are we in possession of a single word of truth concerning the lives of the great men who have played preponderating parts in the history of humanity? Men such as Hercules, Hercules, 
Buddha or Muhammad in all probability we are not in point of fact moreover their real lives are of slight importance to us our interest is to know what our great men were as they are presented by popular legend it is legendary heroes and not for a moment real heroes who have impressed the minds of crowds unfortunately legends even although they have been definitely put on record by books have in themselves no stability the imagination of the crowd continually transforms them as the result of the lapse of time and especially in consequence of racial causes there is a great gulf fixed between the sanguinary Jehovah of the Old Testament and the God of love of Saint Teresa and the Buddha worshipped in China has no traits in common with that venerated in India it is not even necessary that heroes should be separated from us by centuries for their legend to be transformed by the imagination of the crowd the transformation occasionally takes place within a few years in our own day we have seen the legend of one of the greatest heroes of history modified several times in less than 50 years under the Bourbons Napoleon became a sort of idyllic and liberal philanthropist a friend of the humble who according to the poets was destined to be long remembered in the cottage thirty years afterwards this easy-going hero had become a sanguinary despot who after having usurped power and destroyed liberty caused the slaughter of three million men solely to satisfy his ambition at present we are witnessing a fresh transformation of the legend when it has undergone the influence of some dozens of centuries the learned men of the future face to face with these contradictory accounts will perhaps doubt the very existence of the hero as some of them now doubt that of Buddha and will see in him nothing more than a solar myth or a development of the legend of Hercules they will doubtless console themselves easily for this uncertainty for better initiated than we are today in the characteristics and psychology of crowds they will know that history is scarcely capable of preserving the memory of anything except myths 3 the exaggeration and ingenuousness of the sentiments of crowds whether the feelings exhibited by a crowd be good or bad they present the double character of being very simple and very exaggerated on this point as on so many others an individual in a crowd resembles primitive beings inaccessible to fine distinctions he sees things as a whole and is blind to their intermediate phases the exaggeration of the sentiments of a crowd is heightened by the fact that any feeling when once it is exhibited communicating itself very quickly by a process of suggestion and contagion the evident approbation of which it is the subject considerably increases its force the simplicity and exaggeration of the sentiments of crowds have for result that a throng knows neither doubt nor uncertainty like women it goes at once to extremes a suspicion transforms itself as soon as announced into incontrovertible evidence a commencement of antipathy or disapprobation which in the case of an isolated individual would not gain strength becomes at once furious hatred in the case of an individual in a crowd the violence of the feelings of crowds is also increased especially in heterogeneous crowds by the absence of all sense of responsibility the certainty of impunity a certainty the stronger as the crowd is more numerous and the notion of a considerable momentary force due to number make possible in the case of crowds sentiments and acts impossible for the isolated individual in crowds the foolish ignorant and envious persons are freed from their sense of their insignificance and powerlessness 
and are possessed instead by the notion of brutal and temporary but immense strength. Unfortunately, this tendency of crowds towards exaggeration is often brought to bear upon bad sentiments. These sentiments are atavistic residuum of the instincts of the primitive man which the fear of punishment obliges the isolated and responsible individual to curb. Thus, it is that crowds are so easily led into the worst excesses. Still, this does not mean that crowds, skillfully influenced, are not capable of heroism and devotion, and of evincing the loftiest virtues. They are even more capable of showing these qualities than the isolated individual. We shall soon have occasion to revert to this point when we come to study the morality of crowds. Given to exaggeration in its feelings, a crowd is only impressed by excessive sentiments. An orator wishing to move a crowd must make an abusive use of violent affirmations, to exaggerate, to affirm, to resort to repetitions, and never to attempt to prove anything by reasoning are methods of argument well known to speakers at public meetings. Moreover, a crowd exacts a like exaggeration in the sentiments of its heroes. Their apparent qualities and virtues must always be amplified. It has been justly remarked that on the stage a crowd demands from the hero of the peace a degree of courage, morality, and virtue that is never to be found in real life. Quite rightly, importance has been laid on the special standpoint from which matters are viewed in the theater. Such a standpoint exists no doubt, but its rules for the most part have nothing to do with common sense and logic. The art of appealing to crowds is no doubt of an inferior order, but it demands quite special aptitudes. It is often impossible on reading plays to explain their success. Managers of theaters, when accepting pieces, are themselves, as a rule, very uncertain of their success, because to judge the matter it would be necessary that they should be able to transform themselves into a crowd. Here, once more, were we able to embark on more extensive explanations. We should show the preponderating influence of racial considerations. A play which provokes the enthusiasm of the crowd in one country has sometimes no success in another, or has only a partial and conventional success, because it does not put in operation influences capable of working on an altered public. I need not add that the tendency to exaggeration in crowds is only present in the case of sentiments, and not at all in the matter of intelligence. I have already shown that, by the mere fact that an individual forms part of a crowd, his intellectual standard is immediately and considerably lowered. A learned magistrate, M. Tarde, has also verified this fact in his researches on the crimes of crowds. It is only then, with respect to sentiment, that crowds can rise to a very high or, on the contrary, descend to a very low level. 4. The Intolerance, Dictatorialness, and Conservatism of Crowds Crowds are only cognizant of simple and extreme sentiments. The opinions, ideas, and beliefs suggested to them are accepted or rejected as a whole, and considered as absolute truth, or as not less absolute errors. This is always the case with beliefs induced by a process of suggestion, instead of engendered by reasoning. Everyone is aware of the intolerance that accompanies religious beliefs, and of the despotic empire they exercise on men's minds. Being in doubt as to what constitutes truth or error, and having on the other hand a clear notion of its strength, a crowd is as disposed to give authoritative effect to its inspirations as it is intolerant. An individual may accept 
contradiction and discussion. A crowd will never do so. At public meetings, the slightest contradiction on the part of an orator is immediately received with howls or fury and violent invective, soon followed by blows and expulsion should the orator stick to his point. Without the restraining presence of the representatives of authority, the contradictor, indeed, would often be done to death. Dictatorialness and intolerance are common to all categories of crowds, but they are met within a varying degree of intensity. Here, once more, reappears that fundamental notion of race which dominates all the feelings and all the thoughts of men. It is more especially in Latin crowds that authoritativeness and intolerance are found developed in the highest measure. In fact, their development is such in crowds of Latin origin that they have entirely destroyed that sentiment of the independence of the individual so powerful in the Anglo-Saxon. Latin crowds are only concerned with the collective independence of the sect to which they belong, and the characteristic feature of their conception of independence is the need they experience of bringing those who are in disagreement with themselves into immediate and violent subjection to their beliefs. Among the Latin races, the Jacobins of every epoch, from those of the Inquisition downwards, have never been able to attain to a different conception of liberty. Authoritativeness and intolerance are sentiments of which crowds have a very clear notion, which they easily conceive and which they entertain as readily as they put them in practice when once they are imposed upon them. Crowds exhibit a docile respect for force and are but slightly impressed by kindness which for them is scarcely other than a form of weakness. Their sympathies have never been bestowed on easy-going matters, but on tyrants who vigorously oppressed them. It is to these latter that they always erect the loftiest statues. They willingly trample on the despot whom they have stripped of his power, but it is because, having lost his strength, he has resumed his place among the feeble, who are to be despised because they are not to be feared. The type of hero dear to the crowds will always have the semblance of a Caesar. His insignia attracts them, his authority overawes them, and his sword instills them with fear. A crowd is always ready to revolt against a feeble, and to bow down servilely before a strong authority. Should the strength of an authority be intermittent, the crowd always obedient to its extreme sentiments passes alternately from anarchy to servitude and from servitude to anarchy. However, to believe in the predominance among crowds of revolutionary instincts would be to entirely misconstrue their psychology. It is merely their tendency to violence that deceives us on this point. Their rebellious and destructive outbursts are always very transitory. Crowds are too much governed by unconscious considerations and too much subject in consequence to secular hereditary influences not to be extremely conservative. Abandoned to themselves, they soon weary of disorder and instinctively turn to servitude. It was the proudest and most untractable of the Jacobins who acclaimed Bonaparte with greatest energy when he suppressed all liberty and made his hand of iron severely felt. It is difficult to understand history and popular revolutions in particular if one does not take sufficiently into account the profoundly conservative instincts of crowds. They may be desirous, it is true, of changing the names of their institutions, and to obtain these changes they accomplished at times even violent revolutions. But the essence of these institutions is too much the expression of the hereditary needs of the race for them not invariably to abide by it. 
their incessant mobility only exerts its influence on quite superficial matters. In fact, they possess conservative instincts as indestructible as those of all primitive beings. Their fetish-like respect for all traditions is absolute. Their unconscious horror of all novelty capable of changing the essential conditions of their existence is very deeply rooted. Had democracies possessed the power they will today at the same time of the invention of mechanical looms or of the introduction of steam power and of railways, the realization of these inventions would have been impossible or would have been achieved at the cost of revolutions and repeated massacres. It is fortunate for the progress of civilization that the power of crowds only began to exist when the great discoveries of science and industry had already been effected. 5. The Morality of Crowds Taking the word morality to mean constant respect for certain social conventions and the permanent repression of selfish impulses, it is quite evident that crowds are too impulsive and too mobile to be moral. If, however, we include in the term morality the transitory display of certain qualities such as abnegation, self-sacrifice, disinterestedness, devotion, and the need of equity, we may say, on the contrary, that crowds may exhibit at times a very lofty morality. The few psychologists who have studied crowds have only considered them from the point of view of their criminal acts. And noticing how frequent these acts are, they have come to the conclusion that the moral standard of crowds is very low. Doubtless, this is often the case, but why? Simply because our savage, destructive instincts are the inheritance left dormant in all of us from the primitive ages. In the life of the isolated individual, it would be dangerous for him to gratify these instincts, while his absorption in an irresponsible crowd, in which, in consequence, he is assured of impunity, gives him entire liberty to follow them. Being unable in the ordinary course of events to exercise these destructive instincts on our fellow men, we confine ourselves to exercising them on animals. The passion so widespread for the chase and the acts of ferocity of crowds proceed from one and the same source. A crowd which slowly slaughters a defenseless victim displays a very cowardly ferocity. But for the philosopher, this ferocity is very closely related to that of the huntsmen who gather in dozens for the pleasure of taking part in the pursuit and killing of a luckless stag by their hounds. A crowd may be guilty of murder, incendiarism, and every kind of crime, but it is also capable of very lofty acts of devotion, sacrifice, and disinterestedness of acts much loftier indeed than those of which the isolated individual is capable. Appeals to sentiments of glory, honor, and patriotism are particularly likely to influence the individual forming part of a crowd, and often to the extent of obtaining from him the sacrifice of his life. History is rich in examples analogous to those furnished by the Crusaders and the Volunteers of 1793. Collectivities alone are capable of great disinterestedness and great devotion. How numerous are the crowds that have heroically faced death for beliefs, ideas, and phrases that they scarcely understood. The crowds that go on strike do so far more in obedience to an order than to obtain an increase of the slender salary with which they make shift. Personal interest is very rarely a powerful motive force with crowds. While it is almost the exclusive motive of the conduct of the isolated individual, 
It is assuredly not self-interest that has guided crowds in so many wars, incomprehensible as a ruler to their intelligence. Wars in which they have allowed themselves to be massacred as easily as the larks hypnotized by the mirror of the hunter. Even in the case of absolute scoundrels, it often happens that the mere fact of their being in a crowd endows them for the moment with very strict principles of morality. Taine calls attention to the fact that the perpetrators of the September massacres deposited on the table of the committees the pocketbooks and jewels they had found on their victims and with which they could easily have been able to make away. The howling, swarming, ragged crowd which invaded the Tuileries during the revolution of 1848 did not lay hands on any of the objects that excited its astonishment and one of which would have meant bread for many days. This moralization of the individual by the crowd is not certainly a constant rule but it is a rule frequently observed. It is even observed in circumstances much less grave than those I have just cited. I have remarked that in the theater a crowd exacts from the hero of the piece exaggerated virtues, and it is a commonplace observation that an assembly, even though composed of inferior elements, shows itself as a rule very prudish. The debauche the soutenaire, the rough, often break out into murmurs at a slightly risque scene or expression, though they be very harmless in comparison with their customary conversation. If then crowds often abandon themselves to low instincts, they also set the example at times of acts of lofty morality. If disinterestedness, resignation, and absolute devotion to a real or chimerical idea are moral virtues, it may be said that crowds often possess these virtues to a degree rarely attained by the wisest philosophers. Doubtless they practice them unconsciously, but that is of small import. We should not complain too much that crowds are more especially guided by unconscious considerations and are not given to reasoning. Had they in certain cases reasoned and consulted their immediate interests, it is possible that no civilization would have grown up on our planet and humanity would have no history. Chapter 3 The Ideas, Reasoning Power, and imagination of crowds. 1. The ideas of crowds. When studying in a preceding work the part played by ideas in the evolution of nations, we showed that every civilization is the outcome of a small number of fundamental ideas that are very rarely renewed. We showed how these ideas are implanted in the minds of crowds with what difficulty the process is affected and the power possessed by the ideas in question when once it has been accomplished. Finally, we saw that great historical perturbations are the result, as a rule, of changes in these fundamental ideas. Having treated this subject at sufficient length, I shall not return to it now but shall confine myself to saying a few words on the subject of such ideas as are accessible to crowds, and of the forms under which they conceive them. They may be divided into two classes. In one, we shall place accidental and passing ideas created by the influences of the movement, infatuation for an individual or a doctrine, for instance. In the other, will be classed the fundamental ideas to which the environment, the laws of heredity, and public opinion give a very great stability. 
Such ideas are the religious beliefs of the past and the social and democratic ideas of today. These fundamental ideas resemble the volume of the water of a stream slowly pursuing its course. The transitory ideas are like the small waves, forever changing, which agitate its surface, and are more visible than the progress of the stream itself, although without real importance. At the present day, the great fundamental ideas, which were the mainstay of our fathers, are tottering more and more. They have lost all solidity, and at the same time, the institutions resting upon them are severely shaken. Every day, there are formed a great many of those transitory minor ideas of which I have just been speaking, but very few of them, to all appearance, seem endowed with vitality and destined to acquire a preponderating influence. Whatever be the ideas suggested to crowds, they can only exercise effective influence on condition that they assume a very absolute, uncompromising, and simple shape. They present themselves then in the guise of images, and are only accessible to the masses under this form. These image-like ideas are not connected by any logical bond of analogy or succession, and may take each other's place like the slides of a magic lantern which the operator withdraws from the groove in which they were placed one above the other. This explains how it is that the most contradictory ideas may seem to be simultaneously current in crowds. According to the chances of the moment, a crowd will come under the influence of one of the various ideas stored up in its understanding, and is capable in consequence of committing the most dissimilar acts. Its complete lack of the critical spirit does not allow of its perceiving these contradictions. This phenomenon is not peculiar to crowds. It is to be observed in many isolated individuals, not only among primitive beings, but in the case of all those, the fervent sectaries of a religious faith, for instance, who by one side or another of their intelligence are akin to primitive beings. I have observed its presence to a curious extent in the case of educated Hindus brought up at our European universities and having taken their degree. A number of Western ideas have been superposed on their unchangeable and fundamental hereditary or social ideas. According to the chances of the moment, the one or the other set of ideas showed themselves each with their special accompaniment of acts or utterances, the same individual presenting in this way the most flagrant contradictions. These contradictions are more apparent than real, for it is only hereditary ideas that have sufficient influence over the isolated individual to become motives of conduct. It is only when, as the result of the intermingling of different races, a man is placed between different hereditary tendencies that his acts from one moment to another may be really entire contradictory. It would be useless to insist here on these phenomena, although their psychological importance is capital. I am of opinion that at least ten years of travel and observation would be necessary to arrive at a comprehension of them. Ideas being only accessible to crowds after having assumed a very simple shape must often undergo the most thoroughgoing transformations to become popular. It is especially when we are dealing with somewhat lofty philosophic or scientific ideas that we see how far-reaching are the modifications they require in order to lower them to the level of the intelligence of crowds. These modifications are dependent on the nature of the crowds, or of the race to which the crowds belong. But their tendency is always belittling and in the direction of simplification. This explains the fact that, from the social point of view, there is in reality scarcely any such thing as a hierarchy of ideas. That is to say, as ideas of greater or less elevation. However great or true an idea may have been to begin with, 
it is deprived of almost all that which constituted its elevation and its greatness by the mere fact that it has come within the intellectual range of crowds and exerts an influence upon them. Moreover, from the social point of view, the hierarchical value of an idea, its intrinsic worth, is without importance. The necessary point to consider is the effect it produces. The Christian ideas of the Middle Ages, the democratic ideas of the last century, or the social ideas of today are assuredly not very elevated. Philosophically considered, they can only be regarded as somewhat sorry errors, and yet their power has been and will be immense, and they will count for a long time to come among the most essential factors that determine the conduct of states. Even when an idea has undergone the transformations which render it accessible to crowds, it only exerts influence when, by various processes which we shall examine elsewhere, it has entered the domain of the unconscious, when indeed it has become a sentiment, for which much time is required. For it must not be supposed that merely because the justness of an idea has been proved, it can be productive or of effective action even on cultivated minds. This fact may be quickly appreciated by noting how slight is the influence of the clearest demonstration on the majority of men. Evidence, if it be very plain, may be accepted by an educated person, but the convert will be quickly brought back by his unconscious self to his original conceptions. See him again after the lapse of a few days, and he will put forward afresh his old arguments in exactly the same terms. He is in reality under the influence of anterior ideas that have become sentiments, and it is such ideas alone that influence the more recondite motives of our actions and utterances. It cannot be otherwise in the case of crowds. When by various processes an idea has ended by penetrating into the minds of crowds, it possesses an irresistible power and brings about a series of effects, opposition to which is bootless. The philosophical ideas which resulted in the French Revolution took nearly a century to implant themselves in the mind of the crowd. Their irresistible force, when once they had taken root, is known. The striving of an entire nation towards the conquest of social equality and the realization of abstract rights and ideal liberties caused the tottering of all thrones and profoundly disturbed the Western world. During twenty years, the nations were engaged in internecine conflict, and Europe witnessed hecatombs that would have terrified Genghis Khan and Tamerlan. The world had never seen on such a scale what may result from the promulgation of an idea. A long time is necessary for ideas to establish themselves in the minds of crowds, but just as long a time is needed for them to be eradicated. For this reason, crowds, as far as ideas are concerned, are always several generations behind learned men and philosophers. All statesmen are well aware today of the admixture of error contained in the fundamental ideas I referred to a short while back. But, as the influence of these days is still very powerful, they are obliged to govern in accordance with principles in the truth of which they have ceased to believe. 2. The Reasoning Power of Crowds it cannot absolutely be said that crowds do not reason and are not to be influenced by reasoning. However, the arguments they employ and those which are capable of influencing them are, from a logical point of view, of such an inferior kind that it is only by way of analogy that they can be described as reasoning. The inferior reasoning of crowds is based, 
just as is reasoning of a high order on the association of ideas but between the ideas associated by crowds there are only apparent bonds of analogy or succession the mode of reasoning of crowds resembles that of the Esquimo who knowing from experience that ice a transparent body melts in the mouth concludes that glass also a transparent body should also melt in the mouth or that of the savage who imagines that by eating the heart of a courageous foe he acquires his bravery or of the workman who having been exploited by one employer of labor immediately concludes that all employers exploit their men the characteristics of the reasoning of crowds are the association of dissimilar things possessing a merely apparent connection between each other and the immediate generalization of particular cases it is arguments of this kind that are always presented to crowds by those who know how to manage them they are the only arguments by which crowds are to be influenced a chain of logical argumentation is totally incomprehensible to crowds and for this reason it is permissible to say that they do not reason or that they reason falsely and are not to be influenced by reasoning astonishment is felt at times on reading certain speeches at their weakness and yet they had an enormous influence on the crowds which listened to them but it is forgotten that they were intended to persuade collectivites and not to be read by philosophers an orator in intimate communication with a crowd can evoke images by which it will be seduced if he is successful his object has been attained and twenty volumes of harangues always the outcome of reflection are not worth the few phrases which appeal to the brains it was required to convince it would be superfluous to add that the powerlessness of crowds to reason or right prevents them displaying any trace of the critical spirit prevents them that is from being capable of discerning truth from error or of forming a precise judgment on any matter judgments accepted by crowds are merely judgments forced upon them and never judgments adopted after discussion in regard to this matter the individuals who do not rise above the level of a crowd are numerous the ease with which certain opinions obtain general acceptance results more especially from the impossibility experienced by the majority of men of forming an opinion peculiar to themselves and based on reasoning of their own three the imagination of crowds just as is the case with respect to persons in whom the reasoning power is absent the figurative imagination of crowds is very powerful very active and very susceptible of being keenly impressed the images evoked in their mind by a personage an event an accident are almost as lifelike as the reality crowds are to some extent in the position of the sleeper whose reason suspended for the time being allows the arousing in his mind of images of extreme intensity which would quickly be dissipated could they be submitted to the action of reflection crowds being incapable both of reflection and of reasoning are devoid of the notion of improbability and it is to be noted that in a general way it is the most improbable things that are the most striking this is why it happens that it is always the marvelous and legendary side of events that more especially strike crowds when a civilization is analyzed it is seen that in reality it is the marvelous and the legendary that are its true supports appearances have always played a much more important part than reality in history where the unreal is always of greater moment than the real crowds being only capable of thinking in images are only to be impressed by images it is only images that terrify or attract them and become motives of action for this reason theatrical representations 
in which the image is shown in its most clearly visible shape always have an enormous influence on crowds. Bread and spectacular shows constituted for the plebeians of ancient Rome the ideal of happiness and they asked for nothing more. Throughout the successive ages this ideal has scarcely varied. Nothing has a greater effect on the imagination of crowds of every category than theatrical representations. The entire audience experiences at the same time the same emotions and if these emotions are not at once transformed into acts it is because the most unconscious spectator cannot ignore that he is the victim of illusions and that he has laughed or wept over imaginary adventures. Sometimes however the sentiments suggested by the images are so strong that they tend like habitual suggestions to transform themselves into acts. The story has often been told of the manager of a popular theater who in consequence of his only playing somber dramas was obliged to have the actor who took the part of the traitor protected on his leaving the theater to defend him against the violence of the spectators indignant at the crimes imaginary though they were which the traitor had committed we have here in my opinion one of the most remarkable indications of the mental state of crowds and especially of the facility with which they are suggestioned the unreal has almost as much influence on them as the real they have an evident tendency not to distinguish between the two. The power of conquerors and the strength of states is based on the popular imagination. It is more particularly by working upon this imagination that crowds are led. All great historical facts, the rise of Buddhism, of Christianity, of Islamism, the Reformation, the French Revolution, and in our time the threatening invasion of socialism are the direct or indirect consequences of strong impressions produced on the imagination of the crowd. Moreover all the great statesmen of every age in every country including the most absolute despots have regarded the popular imagination as the basis of their power and they have never attempted to govern in opposition to it. It was by becoming a Catholic, said Napoleon to the Council of State, that I terminated the Vendine War. By becoming a Mussulman, that I obtained a footing in Egypt. By becoming an Ultramontane, that I won over the Italian priest. And had I to govern a nation of Jews, I will rebuild Solomon's temple. Never perhaps since Alexander and Caesar has any great man better understood how the imagination of the crowd should be impressed? His constant preoccupation was to strike it. He bore it in mind in his victories, in his harangues, in his speeches, in all his acts. On his deathbed it was still in his thoughts. How is the imagination of crowds to be impressed? We shall soon see. Let us confine ourselves for the moment to saying that the feat is never to be achieved by attempting to work upon the intelligence or reasoning faculty. That is to say, by way of demonstration. It was not by means of cunning rhetoric that Antony succeeded in making the populace rise against the murderers of Caesar. It was by reading his will to the multitude and pointing to his corpse. Whatever strikes the imagination of crowds presents itself under the shape of a startling and very clear image. Freed from all accessory explanation or merely having as accompaniment a few marvelous or mysterious facts, examples in point are a great victory, a great miracle, a great crime, or a great hope. Things must be laid before the crowd as a whole, and their genesis must never be indicated. A hundred petty crimes or petty accidents will not strike the imagination of crowds in the least.
whereas a single great crime or a single great accident will profoundly impress them, even though the results be infinitely less disastrous than those of the hundred small accidents put together. The epidemic of influenza, which caused the death but a few years ago of 5,000 persons in Paris alone, made very little impression on the popular imagination. The reason was that this veritable hecatomb was not embodied in any visible image, but was only learnt from statistical information furnished weekly. An accident which should have caused the death of only 500 instead of 5,000 persons, but on the same day and in public, as the outcome of an accident appealing strongly to the eye, by the fall, for instance, of the Eiffel Tower, would have produced, on the contrary, an immense impression on the imagination of the crowd. The probable loss of a transatlantic steamer that was supposed, in the absence of news, to have gone down in mid-ocean, profoundly impressed the imagination of the crowd for a whole week. Yet official statistics show that 850 sailing vessels and 203 steamers were lost in the year 1894 alone. The crowd, however, was never for a moment concerned by these successive losses. Much more important, though, they were as far as regards the destruction of life and property than the loss of the Atlantic liner in question could have possibly been. It is not, then, the facts in themselves that strike the popular imagination, but the way in which they take place and are brought under notice. It is necessary that by their con condensation, if I may thus express myself, they should produce a startling image which fills and besets the mind. To know the art of impressioning the imagination of crowds is to know at the same time the art of governing them. Chapter 4 A Religious Shape Assumed by All the Convictions of Crowds We have shown that crowds do not reason that they accept or reject ideas as a whole, that they tolerate neither discussion nor contradiction, and that the suggestions brought to bear on them invade the entire field of their understanding and tend at once to transform themselves into acts. We have shown that crowds suitably influenced are ready to sacrifice themselves for the ideal with which they have been inspired. We have also seen that they only entertain violent and extreme sentiments, that in their case sympathy quickly becomes adoration, and antipathy almost as soon as it is aroused is transformed into hatred. These general indications furnish us already with a presentiment of the nature of the convictions of crowds. When these convictions are closely examined, whether at epochs marked by fervent religious faith or by great political upheavals such as those of the last century, it is apparent that they always assume a peculiar form which I cannot better define than by giving it the name of a religious sentiment. This sentiment has very simple characteristics such as worship of a being supposed superior, fear of the power with which the being is credited, blind submission to its commands, inability to discuss its dogmas, the desire to spread them, and a tendency to consider as enemies all by whom they are not accepted. Whether such a sentiment apply to an invisible god, to a wooden or stone idol, to a hero, or to a political conception, provided that it presents the preceding characteristics, its essence always remains religious. The supernatural and the miraculous are found to be present to the same extent. Crowds unconsciously accord a mysterious power to the political formula, or the victorious leader that for the moment arouses their enthusiasm. A person is not religious solely when he worships a divinity, but when he puts all the resources of his mind the complete submission of his will, and the whole-souled ardor of fanaticism 
at the service of a cause or an individual who becomes the goal and guide of his thoughts and actions. Intolerance and fanaticism are the necessary accompaniments of the religious sentiment. They are inevitably displayed by those who believe themselves in the possession of the secret of earthly or eternal happiness. These two characteristics are to be found in all men grouped together when they are inspired by a conviction of any kind. The Jacobins of the Reign of Terror were at bottom as religious as the Catholics of the Inquisition and their cruel ardor proceeded from the same source. The convictions of crowds assume those characteristics of blind submission, fierce intolerance, and the need of violent propaganda which are inherent in the religious sentiment, and it is for this reason that it may be said that all their beliefs have a religious form. The hero acclaimed by a crowd is a veritable god for that crowd. Napoleon was such a god for fifteen years, and a divinity never had more fervent worshippers or sent men to their death with greater ease. The Christian and pagan gods never exercised a more absolute empire over the minds that had fallen under their sway. All founders of religious or political creeds have established them solely because they were successful in inspiring crowds with the fanatical sentiments which have as a result that men find their happiness in worship and obedience and are ready to lay down their lives for their idol. This has been the case at all epochs. Fustel de Colanges, in his excellent work on Roman Gaul, justly remarks that the Roman Empire was in no wise maintained by force, but by the religious admiration it inspired. It would be without a parallel in the history of the world, he observes rightly, that a form of government held in popular detestation should have lasted for five centuries. It would be inexplicable that the thirty legions of the empire should have constrained a hundred million men to obedience. The reason of their obedience was that the emperor who personified the greatness of Rome was worshipped like a divinity by unanimous consent. There were altars in honor of the emperor in the smallest townships of his realm. From one end of the empire to the other a new religion was seen to arise in those days which had for its divinities the emperors themselves. Some years before the Christian era the whole of Gaul, represented by sixty cities, built in common a temple near the town of Lyons in honor of Augustus. Its priests, elected by the united Gallic cities, were the principal personages in their country. It is impossible to attribute all this to fear and servility. Whole nations are not servile, and especially for three centuries. It was not the courtiers who worshipped the prince, it was Rome. And it was not Rome merely, but it was Gaul, it was Spain, it was Greece, and Asia. Today, the majority of the great men who have swayed men's mind no longer have altars, but they have statues, or their portraits are in the hands of their admirers, and the cult of which they are the object is not notably different from that accorded to their predecessors. An understanding of the philosophy of history is only to be got by a thorough appreciation of this fundamental point of the psychology of crowds. The crowd demands a God before everything else. It must not be supposed that these are the superstitions of a bygone age which reason has definitely banished. Sentiment has never been vanquished in its eternal conflict with reason. Crowds will hear no more of the words divinity and religion in whose name they were so long enslaved, but they have never possessed so many fetishes as in the last hundred years, and the old divinities have never had so many statues and altars raised in their honor. Those who in recent years have studied the popular movement known under the name of Bolangism have been able to see with what ease the religious instincts of crowds are ready to revive.
There was not a country inn that did not possess the hero's portrait. He was credited with the power of remedying all injustices and all evils, and thousands of men would have given their lives for him. Great might have been his place in history had his character been at all on a level with his legendary reputation. It is thus a very useless commonplace to assert that a religion is necessary for the masses, because all political, divine, and social creeds only take root among them on the condition of always assuming the religious shape, a shape which obviates the danger of discussion. Were it possible to induce the masses to adopt atheism, this belief would exhibit all the intolerant ardor of a religious sentiment, and in its exterior forms would soon become a cult. The evolution of the small positivist sect furnishes us a curious proof in point. What happened to the nihilist whose story is related by that profound thinker Dostoevsky has quickly happened to the positivist. Illumined one day by the light of reason, he broke the images of divinities and saints that adorned the altar of a chapel, extinguished the candles, and without losing a moment, replaced the destroyed objects by the works of atheistic philosophers, such as Buchner and Molshot, after which he piously relighted the candles. The object of his religious beliefs had been transformed, but can it be truthfully said that his religious sentiments had changed? Certain historical events, and they are precisely the most important, I again repeat, are not to be understood unless one has attained to an appreciation of the religious form which the convictions of crowds always assume in the long run. There are social phenomena that need to be studied far more from the point of view of the psychologist than from that of the naturalist. The great historian, Taine, has only studied the revolution as a naturalist, and on this account the real genesis of events has often escaped him. He has perfectly observed the facts but from want of having studied the psychology of crowds, he has not always been able to trace their causes. The facts, having appalled him by their bloodthirsty, anarchic, and ferocious side, he has scarcely seen in the heroes of the great drama anything more than a horde of epileptic savages abandoning themselves without restraint to their instincts. The violence of the revolution, its massacres, its need of propaganda, its declarations of war upon all things are only to be properly explained by reflecting that the revolution was merely the establishment of a new religious belief in the mind of the masses. The reformation, the massacre of St. Bartholomew, the French religious wars, the Inquisition, the reign of terror, are phenomena of an identical kind, brought about by crowds, animated by those religious sentiments, which necessarily lead those imbued with them to pitilessly extirpate by fire and sword whoever is opposed to the establishment of the new faith. The methods of the Inquisition are those of all whose convictions are genuine and sturdy. Their convictions would not deserve these epithets did they resort to other methods. Upheavals analogous to those I have just cited are only possible when it is the soul of the masses that brings them about. The most absolute despots could not cause them. When historians tell us that the massacre of St. Bartholomew was the work of a king, they show themselves as ignorant of the psychology of crowds as of that of sovereigns. Manifestations of this order can only proceed from the soul of crowds. The most absolute power of the most despotic monarch 
can scarcely do more than hasten or retard the movement of their apparition. The massacre of St. Bartholomew or the religious wars were no more the work of kings than the reign of terror was the work of Rolfier, Danton, or St. Just. At the bottom of such events is always to be found the working of the soul of the masses, and never the power of potentates.